we go. Cool. Good evening, nature fans, and welcome to another good natured hour. Um, maybe we'll say the holiday edition since it's uh, December 20th. Um, Hanukkah has started, Christmas is a few days away. <clears throat> maybe you're looking for yet one more last minute gift idea. Um, and this I think this isn't this isn't a new book. I believe it was first published in um, I think it was 1988. Um, Bob, you had given this to me. Yeah, first um, first edition was in 1988. It's actually been um, so popular they they created a second edition in I think it was 2013. Oh, that's right in. Tomorrow's the solstice, too. I mean, we are just <laughs> dripping with reasons to celebrate. Um, and uh, yeah, solstice is a great gift giving um, uh, occasion as well. Uh, this book, though, if, you, if, if you're a birder, if you know birder, if you're looking for uh, a good laugh, this field guide to little known and seldom seen birds of North America, um, it's a great uh, take a great spoof on um, field guides. Uh, the descriptions are really well, um, they're written very much in the style of uh, field guides. Some, uh, like the uh, the Southern Snake Strangler, come with range maps. Um, there was one here I thought was seasonally appropriate. Um, Oh, here, the monarch warbler seldom seen because it camouflages itself within migrating uh, groups of monarchs. Um, let's see, the gilded worm weaver, uh, the eastern spider spitter, uh, the American bunting, um, which sounds like an actual species, but um, it... Uh, <laughs> um, the American uh, bunting population was decimated by milliners for Independence Day parade hats. Following bicentennial activities in 1976, the population has increased, and the indications are that it is reclaiming some of its original habitat from the English sparrow. Anyway, the one I wanted to show you tonight was the, uh, the waddly grouse. Um, uh, Obesia rotundus is its uh, scientific name. And you'll notice that in addition to the uh, picture that shows the field marks, they also have uh, the bird in full flight, noting its, its low altitude, um, the bird pigging out, and then a serving suggestion. Um, it says this ground dwelling bird doesn't have much choice. It's difficult to flush since, uh, since lift from its wings is not sufficient to raise its body more than a few inches above the ground. When not sleeping, the waddly grouse spends most of its time eating. Coloration of the bib varies with food and berry stains. Call is a single <laughs> belch-like note. This highly sought after bird is essentially self-basting. Observation hint. Specimens of this bird can sometimes be found in the fro frozen food sections of gourmet shops. Such sightings can only be added to your grocery list, however. So yeah, uh, the, the newer edition has a different look to it. It's got a dark cover on it. It is available through Amazon. So if you're, you're looking to have a little fun, um, either yourself or uh, if you want to give a gift, um, check this out. A Field Guide to Little Known and Seldom Seen Birds of North America. Ben Catherine and John Sill, illustrations by John C. Sill. Um, okay, so that was the gift suggestion. Um, we also had a little visit from uh, Nature Santa Claus here at Good Natured World Headquarters today. Uh, let me show you this treasure that got dropped off earlier. You see what this is? Okay, well, you can see it's a skull. Does anybody want to take a crack at what kind of skull it is? I'll give you a, a nice profile. And then the head on. Um, so there's a clue when you look at it. 
um, right here. So clearly when you look at it from the side, you see this gap here, which um, I just learned the word for this gap the other day. I was at a meeting with our friends over at Creek Bend and um, Ranger Josh said, I, I think he called this the diastema. It's a, it's a word that means a gap. Um, a gap in, I think it can refer to a lot of different gaps on a body, but um, uh, yeah, rodents, so there's a clue. Rodents always have this gap here because they don't have um, uh, canine teeth. Um, they've got incisors, premolars, and molars. And so there's this, this gap here. Um, these teeth are made for gnawing. And when we look at it this way, we see these teeth are white. Now there's only one rodent that has white incisors. You may be thinking, all right, well, you know, does that mean it's the only rodent that brushes its teeth? No, um, rodents in general, they have either yellow um, incisors, like you can see, this is kind of a golden yellow. I believe this was a fox squirrel skull. Um, again, incisors and then the gap and then the molars. Probably the most famous. Uh, gnawing rodent teeth are that of the beaver. Um, this is a really deep orange. I don't know if I can, there, if I block the light, you can see it's a really, really dark teeth. Um, rodents, so they, they have to um, keep those gnawing incisors sharp. If we look on the, um, from this edge here, you see how there's that sharp edge here? Um, the front of the tooth, this hard enamel, wears slower than the dentin on the back side of the, uh, the teeth. So as they're chewing, uh, the back, uh, it's like they're constantly sharpening their teeth as they're gnawing. And as long as the, um, the teeth, the jaws stay aligned, everything works out fine. Um, if one tooth maybe gets broken or there's a malocclusion and the teeth don't line up anymore, that can spell trouble. An incisor can start to grow long. Sometimes um, a, a bottom incisor can grow up and pierce uh, the top of uh, the, the, actually go into the brain case. Same thing can happen uh, in a, a top incisor uh, if there's nothing underneath it, if, you know, if a bottom incisor goes, goes missing. Um, they don't sharp, sharpen properly either. And these things just keep growing and growing. This tooth actually goes way up. I found beaver teeth that are like two inches, over two inches long. They go way up into the skull and they just keep growing out. They can curl around and poke back through the palate into the brain. So um, scary stuff can happen if uh, you know, the, the uh, rodent's teeth get out of alignment. But anyway, I'm getting off track. This... Um, uh, enamel uh, in the beaver contains iron, which is why it's so dark um, and a you know, very strong uh, material helps the, uh, the enamel stay strong. I'm not sure if it's iron in all rodents though, because uh, other rodent teeth aren't quite as dark. Definitely minerals are being concentrated there though to keep that enamel uh, hard. Um, Getting back to today's little gift, the one rodent here, I don't know if it's around the world, but it's certainly true here in the United States. And if we bring it down locally to Kane County, the only rodent with white enamel is a woodchuck. Uh, this is a woodchuck skull. Uh, it was a male, the finder who uh, had it, um, prepped the, uh, the skull and dropped it off today. Um, it'll be a nice addition to the, uh, <laughs> the collection of parts we have here at Good Natured World Headquarters. Merry Christmas, huh? Um, okay, let's see. I've got a few slides I'd like to share with you. Some are pictures I took, and then some we've, we had um, uh, quite a bit of correspondence this week. I think people are, uh, maybe they're home, uh, they're off this week. Um, maybe they're killing time at work. <laughs> anyway, I've gotten a few, a uh, few emails with questions. So uh, let's go ahead and um, uh, see if we can get our slideshow started here. Uh, we're gonna pick. Let's 
screen to share. And um, yeah. There we go. All right, so we're starting off with the 50 pesos bill from Mexico. I know I didn't go there and no, nobody gave me 50 pesos. Um, I used this because I was looking and I, I thought I had a picture of an axolotl. For years, we had an axolotl at Hickory Knolls. Um, axolotls, they're, they're actually, uh, they're salamanders, but they stay in their larval form. Um, we used to have one at Hickory Knolls. Um, I named him Axel. And um, he was uh, he was brought actually by a, a gentleman from U.S. Fish and Wildlife who was doing a program on salamanders for us. And um, when we got little Axel, he, I swear he was no bigger than my little pinky. And uh, when we uh, uh, traded him away, he was the size of a pretty good sized tiger salamander. But he still lived uh, aquatically. Um, axolotls. Uh, they have what's called um, a neotenic body, which means it it becomes uh, it matures in that it's able to reproduce, but it retains its uh, juvenile life form. And for salamanders, that means they keep their gills and they swim in the water. They don't leave. Uh, the axolotls don't leave water usually. Now. Um, Axolotls in the wild um, are pretty rare. I, I heard they're 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 close to extinction, which is probably why the Mexican government chose to put them on uh, some of their currency. But they uh, they live in these um, mountainous uh, glacial fed lakes, and uh, they evolved over time this lifestyle of just not leaving the water if. Now our local tiger salamanders, yeah, they um, they uh, breed in ephemeral ponds and they uh, transform over a few months time from this uh, gilled uh, immature form into uh, a air breathing, land dwelling uh, adult form. And uh, then they just go back to the water once a year to breed. Um, the, uh, they evolved that way over time so that they could disperse over a, a wider range. Um, the axolotls, they, you know, had everything they could possibly need there in those, uh, those mountainous lakes, and they, they never uh, developed that land-dwelling part of their life. Now, um, I said that they're, they're almost uh, extinct in the wild, but there are millions and millions of axolotls all over the world because they're really popular uh, in the pet trade and they are really popular in research. So um, uh, they've been bred, uh, they've been crossbred. Uh, I was reading about how uh, uh, the uh, albino axolotls that are super popular, that uh, that gene for albinism actually came from a tiger salamander. So they've been uh, crossed a little bit. They, they, uh, they are actually the same uh, genus as our tiger salamanders, Ambystema. Uh, so they, you know, they are pretty closely related to them. Uh, the reason I'm, I'm bringing all of this up is because the other day uh, I had the opportunity to see what an axolotl looks like that does um, morph and uh, become a land dwelling creature. Uh, this was um, a little, uh, we paid a visit a couple, uh, when was that? Recently, we uh, a, a local resident here in St. Charles was making a, a really nice donation to Hickory Knolls in the form of a, uh, an enclosure for, uh, a bearded dragon. Their beardy had passed on and they wanted to uh, give this really nice cage set up to the nature center. So great, great addition to the collection there. But they said, yeah, we've got this, the, the, the wife said, you know, this is a, a 
thing, you know, my, my husband had it and, and uh, you know, now it, it lives in this other tank we have. She showed it to us. Um, uh, this is what an axolotl turns into should they um, morph and come out on land. It's, it's not impossible. Um, there is, I, I don't completely understand the, the biomechanics behind it, but um, when iodine is present in water, it can um, cause the, uh, the axolotls to, um, to leave, to, to come out and, and be land dwellers. Um, I don't know what this particular creature's history was, but um, here it is. And they, they don't tra transform back and forth. They're not gonna morph back into, uh, they're not gonna regrow their gills or anything once they come out. Um, they live on land the rest of their lives. From what I understand, uh, morphing for an axolotl will um, quite possibly shorten its life. I think I've got another picture of it here. Yeah, there we go. See, it's got a lot of salamander characteristics to it. Looks well, it is. I mean, it is a salamander, but it um, the color isn't at all like the tigers that we see here. Um, these folds here on the side are a little bit different looking. Um, it was uh, it was pretty good size, about the size of the tiger salamanders that we see around here. But yeah, I just thought it was kind of cool. Uh, I read about um, axolotls that had morphed, but I never actually had a chance to see one. Maybe you haven't either, but there you go. All right, let's um, let's take a look here. This is um, a photo that was sent in uh, by a reader. He was out in the field next to his house and he found these nests not too far apart and not too far off the ground. And he was really intrigued um, by uh, some of the nest material. You might recognize it. Um, it's actually, you know, um, looking at what birds' nests are made of, um, and I can't remember the uh, if there's a specific name for this area of study or not, but it's it's the, uh, the human influence on bird nest materials over time. Like if we were to go back, say you know 150 years, um, we'd find things uh, like sheep's wool and in horse hair, uh, things that were more commonly seen at that time because of our more rural or agrarian uh, agricultural type of society that we have. And it, today we see things, uh, scary things like you know, fishing line and dental floss and, and this stuff here, which is the blue plastic material from, from tarps. Um, and I, I've seen this in nests too. Um, there's no um, factor for scale here, but I, I get the sense that these aren't terribly large nests, and I don't see any um, uh, plant floss like the um, like what you'd see in a, a goldfinch nest. Goldfinch, you know, they they uh, will line their um, their nests with plant down. Uh, they love to use thistle down, but they'll also they'll even use little it's a dandelion down too to make that soft lining um and it's it's a tightly woven bowl uh, kind of like this but I, I again i'm not seeing the plant down in these pictures so i kind of think these might have been song sparrow nests and now uh, especially since they were they were pretty low to the ground sometimes song sparrows will build their nests on the ground um if any of you have any other thoughts on this i'd uh, i'd appreciate hearing those. In fact, here we got a couple of chats here too. Phillips Park. Okay, we'll get uh all right. Mrs. Trisha texted a picture of Axel. Okay. We'll we'll get back to axolotls here. Um super cute axolotl at Phillips Park. Thanks, Greg and Kelly. I'll have to go check that out. In fact, I want to do a field trip to Phillips Park. We'll talk about that again in a minute too. Um but uh, so yeah, I don't know if anybody has any any thoughts about um, this, but I, I'm thinking song sparrow just because of um, the the field where they were found, the the height of the nest, the size of the nest. Now the other question would be, is this the same bird that has a fondness for blue? I, 
um that's a that's a good supposition um i don't know i, I suppose it could be a case of one song sparrow seeing what the other one did and go oh look what they did we got to do that too kind of a keeping up with the joneses sort of thing or it might have just been i know i'm uh, pretty sure anyway song sparrows will have at least um two broods in this area so it, it could be that they uh, made two different nests and just used a lot of that nice tarp material. But anyway, it's kind of cool. And it actually makes a, a pretty cool little display, doesn't it? Yep. I guess we're moving on. <laughs> so I was at Hickory Knolls uh, last week. We're uh, anxiously awaiting uh, our bullfrogs further growth. So this is the, the bullfrog. Let's see, we got a side view of them too. This is the bullfrog that we got from the one that was confiscated at O'Hare. Uh, there was that shipment of 50 tadpoles that was confiscated at O'Hare Airport last February. Uh, they didn't have the proper documentation and there was no, um, uh, they were, I can't remember, well, actually I wasn't even sure at the time whether these bullfrog tadpoles were coming to the United States from Canada or whether they were coming, uh, that they were going to Canada from the United States. Something about international borders and no documentation and the person who had them, the tadpole said, oh, it's for a science experiment. But that sort of explanation doesn't fly when you could potentially be introducing um, a, a uh, pathogen, you know, there's there no telling if these uh, tadpoles were, were sick, if they were harboring any diseases. There's uh, a lot of things that can go wrong if you release um, animals, especially amphibians uh, that might be carrying a, a, a fungus or other sort of a, a pathogen into a wild population. Bullfrogs too, they have to be careful with because if they're taken somewhere that they don't naturally occur, if they grow to full size, they can eat pretty much everything else um, other amphibians in a pond, other frogs, uh, fish, they'll even eat, you know, mice and small birds and stuff. So anyway, long story short, uh, those tadpoles were confiscated. Uh, a lot of them did end up dying. Uh, I brought six of them back here um, to St. Charles and uh, distributed um, a couple to another nature center and those did not survive. Uh, we kept four with the intention of, of you know, having maybe two of them survive and then we were gonna share with you a third nature center. We only got one to live and it's this one right here. Um, it's a shy creature. So here you can see it's, it's trying to kind of uh, hunker down and pretend like it's invisible. Its color is also uh, a little dark. Now, um, when I saw it a few weeks ago, it, it was much greener color. I kind of wonder if it's uh, trying to go into a, a brumation. Brumation is the, the uh, word for hibernation of a cold-blooded creature. Um, it's, it, it, feeding on and off, they said. Um, again, I, I don't see the frog every day, but they said if uh, the, the guys at the Nature Center said if they put some uh, some crickets in there, they, they disappear. So they're assuming the frog is eating them. It doesn't really look malnourished. Um, and it's now, um, size-wise, I would say it's about three inches from the tip of its snout to the, uh, the bottom, uh, they call it the vent at the other end. The, um, when you measure animals like this, the, the standard of measurement or the, the where you measure is called the SVL, the snout to vent, vent length. Um, I know some of you have been following uh, the story of the little bullfrog. Uh, it's the sole survivor of the six we brought back. And it sounds like the other ones um, uh, of the 50, so that would be what, 44? I, I don't think any of those made it either. So let that be a lesson. If you hear of anybody who's trying to sneak bullfrogs around, just tell them no. <laughs> it's a bad idea. Um, it's it's tough on the uh, the creatures and it's uh, if you don't have the proper permits, it's not legal either. I'll, I'll keep you posted because we, we do have um, a really, really nice um, it's a 75 gallon 
aquarium that was donated that we'd like to make into a, a bullfrog habitat. Um, we haven't done it yet. Right now, this, this bullfrog is living in a, um, a 20 gallon aquarium that you can see is mostly um, moist uh, substrate. That's a, a product called Eco Earth. Uh, it helps keep the humidity high in the enclosure. Um, and then there's a dish of water that the, fit, uh, the frog will, will go and sit in from time to time. But we are a little hesitant yet to put it into this, this bigger tank uh, for fear he doesn't uh, you know, find his food readily. Uh, we wanna kind of grow his enclosure as he grows. But um, bullfrogs, they can get to be that SVL I talked about, they can get to be eight inches or more long. So um, you know, if we do everything right, uh, that 75 gallons will be well used uh, by this uh, frog. We'll see. I'll give you another update uh, in a few months. So stay tuned on that. So next, this so this was a, um, a reader photo that came in the other day. And um, it was from uh, a woman who was, she was feeding the birds in her yard. And uh, we can see here. Um, let's look up here first, though. Uh, <laughs> this bird's kind of looking at the other bird like, what happened to you? But if we look at the bill, um, we can see this is a cardinal. But uh, when we look at the feathers, we can see it's a cardinal that has a decidedly different plumage. Um, this bird has what's called... Um, I've heard it pronounced leucism or leucism. It's leucistic or leucistic, depending on who's doing the talking. Um, but that's a term for um, a, an absence of melanin, uh, which causes these light colored feathers. Melanin is, melanin is the dark pigment. Um, and when the dark pigment goes away, you're left with light pigment or light color. Um, I, this bird would not be uh, called an albino. You may have heard the term partial albinism, but albino means a uh, complete absence of color. And that's where you get the, the red eyes because um, there's not even uh, you know, pigment in the eye. Um, but this bird has, um, I'm guessing it's a, a female because of the brown here, but I don't know, you know, um, when, you, when you start messing with pigments, uh, if you know, whatever it takes to make red is is being suppressed, um, boy, if it's a male, he's really going <laughs> to have to go some to attract the ladies because they're uh, used to to seeing you know somebody who's bright red. I can't tell. Um, let's see if we can zoom in some more. If because there's it's you know it's kind of fuzzy around the head here. I'm assuming there's a crest there and it's just laying down against the top of the head. Um, but, um, anyway, that's what can happen. I, I see this, um, in a, a lot of different species the, the pictures that people send me the most often, uh, and maybe it's because we just have so many robins that it pops up more, but I, I, I get a lot of pictures in the spring and summer of people who have seen, um, robins with this, uh, this different sort of coloration, but uh, this is a, a cardinal. Uh, again, we can see it's got that big old seed cracking bill, um, very similar to the one of uh, the bird that's given it the, the sideways glance up here. Anyway, kind of a cool thing. Um, this particular reader uh, lives north of here, north of King County. So I don't know that this bird would be seen around here, but um, keep your eyes open. You never know. Pretty cool, huh? Uh, let's see, let's move along to our next one. All right, so this one, put your thinking caps on here, folks. Um, uh, there was not a lot of um, text <laughs> with this, uh, even this is a person that actually um, emails me pretty often. And um, the question was, are these cowbirds? And Boy, I tell you, I so I put uh, some different filters uh, on this, and we can do this here too. Let me um, let's see if we go to the edit uh, feature here. If we 
um, increase the lighting a little bit. Um, yeah, I was seeing some some marks on the wings of some of these birds. Um, I don't know if pop means contrast. Um, Yeah, you know, what I my best guess was that it's a mixed flock of blackbirds. Um, black blackbirds meaning um, this person might have seen something that looked like a cowbird. Let's get out of this editing uh, feature here. We'll just zoom in instead. Um, hold on, How do I make that go away. Done. Um, there may have been some some cowbirds mixed in. So so cowbirds, red-winged blackbirds, uh, rusty blackbirds, sometimes yellow-headed blackbirds, but they're pretty rare around here. And then um, uh, starlings too will form these mixed flocks in the winter time. It's uh, it's a great survival strategy. A lot of birds form flocks in the winter. They're not breeding, so that um, that whole territory defense uh, that they put up is uh, going to be um, you know, suppressed or, or not happening. And um, uh, they, there's a lot of advantages to having um, multiple eyes looking to the skies because um, if there's a predator, if a you know, Cooper's hawk, a, um, a sharp-shinned hawk comes in and wants to pluck off a bird, there's going to be a lot more eyes looking for that than there would if there was just um, the pairs that exist during the breeding season. So um, that's my best guess. But again, um, if any of you have any thoughts, uh, I'd love to hear them um, and see what uh, you know. If there's uh, if you have any any additional thoughts. It's so dark; it's hard to tell. You know, um, some of these bills here. You know that that long bill there kind of had me thinking, um, starling. But you know, it, it starlings have yellow bills, and there's just no no way to see the color on that. So anyway, um, oh, how did I do? I boy, this thing is just skipping ahead on me all over the place. Um, if you have thoughts on that, certainly uh, drop them into the chats and um, can share them with the group. Um, I put this photo in because um, I've been talking with uh, one of our favorite uh, uh, naturalists in the field. Um, this is our friend Allison, who um, is currently working out in Wyoming, but uh, will soon be moving to Colorado. Uh, where she's going to be um, working as a field uh, field biologist. Um, she's going to be back in town this coming uh, week for the holidays. So um, she's going to uh, agreed to come and do an in-person good natured talk. So next week, um, you want to be sure and tune in. That'll be um, December 27th. Uh, Allison will be coming in and uh, we've been kicking around a few topics, um, what she's really into right now and what might be few, uh, figuring into her future studies is um, looking at wood frogs. So how wood frogs get through the winter time, they have some amazing adaptations. So um, uh, we'll be looking forward to uh, sitting down and, and chatting with Allison next week. Um, with that, um, there's there seems to be a couple of pictures that went missing from the old uh, uh, album here. So I'm going to stop the screen share and shrug my shoulders. I don't know where it went. We're, we're uh, about 20 minutes short of our usual hour of chat. Does, does anybody have anything else they'd care to share with the group? Um, hate to cut things short, but uh, you know you probably could also use a little extra time at this time of year. I did want to get back to um, to Greg and Kelly's comment real quick. Uh, you guys had mentioned uh, Phillips Park, and that for local people, that is uh, a, a little a hidden gem. That's a 
Uh, it's on the southeast side of Aurora. I haven't been there in a while uh, myself. I used to go there when I worked uh, in Aurora. We would go there probably uh, once or twice a year. Um, it's a small zoo that, um, oh, going back 15 or 20 years now, uh, they decided to, um, instead of having this sort of mishmash of exotics, um, they wanted to see if they could focus uh, a lot of their collection on um, animals in North America. So, um, and Greg and Kelly, sounds like you've been there somewhat recently. Um, I know they have like the, the reptile house and I think they had like a macaw or something in there, but then I know they also had uh, wolves and... Um, um, the, the oxalotl is in the in the reptile house. Okay. Okay. Um, and then th didn't they have like uh, like some elk and um, what I remember is when a siren would go by, you'd hear the wolves howling. Um, and, uh, and they had, uh, boy, I know they they had a pair of eagles there, but then West Nile came through and uh, eagles didn't do so good. I. I I don't know if they've replaced the eagles there. Um, yeah, they still have. They still have the eagles. They've got a bunch of large, you know, birds of prey. The wolves are still there. The elk. They've got like a birdhouse with a bunch of different birds. There's some big cats there, right? There's like a cougar or puma mm -hmm. type thing. Yeah. Yeah. So there's quite a few things, and it's free. Yeah. It's. Do they still have the mastodon too, where you walk in? Um, the mastodon parts in the visitor center right yeah yeah, yeah that was well um, mastodon lake um is a it's a part of the park there too you, it's it's not part of the zoo but you can walk around it and um as they were excavating that i think it was back in the 1930s they found parts of a mastodon so those are those are on display too yeah it's neat it's free uh it's local um and it's uh it's just yeah a, a nice uh, look. In fact, uh, a woman that used to I used to work with uh, named Amber. She has uh, an animal uh, training business, and she's been working with some of the animals at uh, at Phillips Park too. Uh, Kelly, do they do they still have otters, or, or have the otters gone away? I don't remember seeing otters. No. Okay, they were they were pretty prominent before. Um, uh, they well, and their names were Teeter and Totter, <laughs> the otters. Um, but yeah, it, it was it was a neat shift, um, and it it really gave the the zoo a lot of um, a credibility among zookeepers when they you know decided to to um, focus on on native creatures and um, and educate people about all the cool stuff we have right here uh, in North America. Um, Meredith uh, flashed a question. So thanks, thanks for that, Greg and Kelly, and, and other again local folks. After the storm that they say is coming, um, see if you can carve out a little bit of time to to head on over to Phillips Park. It is a, it's a really cool place. Um, and Meredith asks, does the park district have special protocols for blizzards regarding the wildlife? Um, no, actually, we we kind of trust uh that the wildlife now we will i'm sure fill the fill the bird feeders at hickory knolls um the staff there will fill the bird feeders uh before they go home tomorrow um our director has always felt strongly that the park district uh, needs to serve its residents so um our our special protocol is more for people than for wildlife and that's to uh get the buildings open you know, as, as, uh, and keep them open um, as much as we can. I know uh, there's, there were a few times when I was managing Hickory Knolls that it was, it was um, pretty tough to get to work, but it was important that we get the building open and, you know, in case somebody is out, maybe they decided to, you know, get the snowshoes out of the cross country skis and then they, you know, got cold or something to serve as a, as a place where people could come in and warm up. But yeah, as far as the um, the wildlife, um, I, other than than you know putting the feeders out, uh, we kind of trust that they they can rely on their adaptations um, and uh, get themselves through what's coming out. I am I'm, I'm hoping we do, and I, you know I know we've all got different uh, you know thoughts and opinions about uh, winter weather. I 
personally am glad when we get snow because snow provides a lot of protection for a lot of, uh, of wildlife. If you think about how snow coats, um, you can picture either uh, an oak tree that's retained its leaves or one of our local conifers, the, the snow hangs on the boughs of uh, the trees and it insulates uh, around uh, snow. It's, it's frozen water. Um, and it's going to be sometimes uh, warmer than the air temperature. And um, you can get inside a, a, a pine tree or a, a spruce that's got snow hanging all over it. And um, the birds uh, and maybe other creatures too uh, can take shelter inside of snow. There's also, you know, as snow piles up on the ground, um, there's that what we call that subnivian layer that where it, the snow melts off maybe, a, you know, an inch or so away from the ground. Uh, the ground will retain some heat even in winter and um, melt back some of the snow. And there's, there's all kinds of creatures that rely on that layer to uh, scoot around and stay out of sight of uh, some of the predators. Now, mammalian predators, they can use their noses to sniff and they can use their really good ears to listen. Um, uh, hawks and owls, they're relying a lot on sight uh, and uh, hearing too, to see if they can punch through the snow to get to the creatures that are underneath it. But in general, snow does help um, aid in wildlife survival. Now, these cold temperatures that are coming, it doesn't look like it's going to last. In fact, I think I saw uh, at the end of the 10 day that there's a chance of rain next week. I think it's going to be up back in the 40s again. So the, the cold is going to, the severe cold is, it looks like it's not going to be here for a long time. But you know, rain, you know, if, if fur or feathers get wet, underneath that can uh, really affect an animal's survival too. Snow snow's the way to go in wintertime is in terms of offering animals uh, benefits and, and means of survival. Uh, rain and then the, the bitter cold without the snow, those are two things that could really have uh, adverse impacts on our local wildlife. Good question, Meredith, and thanks. I don't know if you're thinking about those little raccoons that were swimming in the pool at Potawatomi this summer, but uh, you know, hopefully they've they've uh, grown up and matured to the point where they um, have found their their winter um, shelters, whether it's in a hollow tree or you know somebody's garage or attic or something. But uh, a bitter cold day, most of the wildlife will lay low, and then they'll come out um, when the winds die down and um, uh, the temperatures will moderate a little bit. So yeah, Park District is definitely more geared towards um, um, offering shelter for the people as opposed to the animals. Good question though. Uh, appreciate you thinking about our wild friends. Um, anybody else? Hi, um, Pam. Oh, oh, hey, yeah. Laura. Hey. You were talking about the eagles at Phillips Park Zoo, and I was wondering, has there been any uh, sightings or anything of interest of our eagles who had their nest taken down? Oh, our moose heart eagles. Well, yeah, I know they're they're rebuilding. Oh, um, they are. Yes, they they started seemed like within a couple of days, um, oh, if not the cool. very next day. Yeah, um, from what I hear, and, and I am not uh, a member of the moose so i've i've not been down to the property but um there's a couple folks that send me updates uh, when they go down there and um it's about a uh, hundred yards uh, i think it's northwest of where the parking lot nest was okay. and it's it's another it's a white pine tree and they were uh, bringing branches to it and just kind of kind of hanging out in that area um, oh, that's good. That's awesome. Yeah. So yeah, you know, I know that you know that that did cause such a, a stir when the decision was made to take that that tree down. But I, I really do think it was the best thing because it just looks so unstable. And I, I know some people said, oh, you know, years ago they should have braced the tree. But you know, you brace something, and 
you know, th there's no telling where a fracture could occur in a tall tree like that. You could, uh, right, you know, where the braces could cause, um, you know, a pressure point that could snap in the wind. Um, I also thought building braces might invite other predators to try and climb up there. Although I don't know, you know, if a raccoon would dare take on an eagle. <laughs> but, but yeah, it just didn't, you know, the, the, the worst thing that could happen would be that tree would come down with eggs or, or nestlings in it. So I, yeah. I think it was a good thing. And yeah. Um, cool. Good to know. So yeah, yeah, I think they're doing fine. Now, I'm kind of wondering, you know, Mama Eagle, she's getting up there because I think it was 2009 when they were first nesting, when, when she had her first mate. Um, uh, her, her, yeah, the, the, um, the male of the, the original pair died, I think it was, was that 2019 when he got hit by a car? Um, and so she said this, this new fella now, um, or newer fella, but she's, she's got to be getting up there. Um, because they're, they're what, five years old when they get their mature plumage in 2009 was 13 years ago, going on 14. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that, that couple evolves, but, um, yeah, they've navigated the, um, the uh, taking down of the nest tree and they're building a new one. And as Meredith points out on Facebook, there's some great documentation. Yeah, there, Dave Soderstrom, um, he's down there, I would say almost every day. He has been chronicling those eagles for years. Um, he's got the, the big old lenses on his camera and um, uh, keeps people well informed. Um, so yeah. Uh, we'll wait and see what uh, what sort of brood they come up with this coming year. Because they're so the owls right now, you know, the great horned owls they're um, advancing through their courtship with an eye on uh, you know laying their eggs as we get into January and, and early February. And then the the eagles get going, you know, towards the end of February and into March they'll be uh, uh, producing their eggs. So um, not too much longer. And so we, we'll see see what they come up with uh in their new nest and their new home which um is a less public location but um that might be better for them in the long run all right um anybody else you have anything for the good of the group um if not I'm going to go on a search because I had like six more photos that I will include in next week's uh, talk. And um, we'll look forward to to seeing Allison. Uh, she's going to, uh, I don't know if we'll do it here uh, at World Headquarters or if we'll pick another location, but um, and she has lots of exciting things to report from her life out West. Uh, and in the meantime, everybody, uh, Merry Christmas, uh, happy holidays, and, uh, and Merry Solstice tomorrow, too. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you all back next week. Thank you, Pam. Merry Christmas to you. Have a good night. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Oh, Merry Christmas, Pam. Bye, Pam. Bye-bye.